Welcome to the Dental Team Podcast. I'm your host, Kira Dent, and I had this crazy idea that maybe I could combine a doctor and a team member's perspective, because let's face it, dentistry can be a challenging profession with those two perspectives. I've been a dental assistant, treatment coordinator, scheduler, filler, office manager, regional manager, practice owner, and I have a team of traveling consultants where we have traveled to over 165 different offices coaching teams. Yep, we don't just understand you, we are you. Our mission is to positively impact the world of dental, and I believe that this podcast is the greatest way I can help elevate teams, grow VIP experiences, reduce stress, and create A-teams. Welcome to the Dental A-Team Podcast. Hello, Dental A-Team listeners. This is Kira, and you guys, I have one of my faves back on the podcast with me. You have heard him before. We have friend. He is currently a dental student out in Kentucky. He has come with me to in-office visits. We just saw each other at Voices of Dentistry. You guys, he is actually a rock, paper, scissor master. We should definitely have him talk about that yeah. situation. <laughs> but friend, how are oh you today? <laughs> Good. Thanks, Kira, for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Yes, yeah, of one course. of my favorite coaches, if not my favorite coach. Well, thanks, so, friend. Thanks. It's Please. always an honor to hang out. Please do share why I just said you're a rock, paper, scissor master, because I think people have to know this about uh, well, you. <laughs> so Voices of Dentistry Local Med had a uh, giveaway, and lo and behold, they used rock, paper, scissors to help decide the champion. So mm-hmm. I was in there to support friends and last thing, her little... Before I knew it, I'm up on stage fighting the last 10 people, and then somehow... One rock, paper, scissors. So he did, you guys. He I was legit. Like the for the wrong thing. <laughs> he just won <laughs> rock, paper, scissor and won a trip to Hawaii. It was pretty impressive. And I was watching him and you didn't even have like two ounces of fear in you. You looked them straight in the eye and you're like, I've got this in the bag. I'm winning this. And you crushed it. It was pretty impressive. So it's, it's a mind game. It's a mind game. I think, <laughs> I think that was the secret. I'm just like, <laughs> I've won already. <laughs> well, but, you uh, did. It was no, so it was fun. Blast. It was so fun. So friend, um, let's, yeah. let's catch back up guys. Uh, the last time friend and I were on the podcast, yeah. he, uh, you guys, he has a side hustle while in dentistry or in dental school where he actually does real estate to pay for it. And you gave me some super good, valuable tips last time. I, I remember like make sure where I'm looking to buy a house is for um, in like a good school area. And people on the podcast might wonder why I've got this obsession. Like, friend, you're not the only person about real estate I put on the podcast. I just want to learn mm-hmm. because I think it's such a such a cool side hustle for team members, for doctors, mm-hmm. doctors buy dental practices. So, okay, we're like on to phase two of real estate today. Teach, teach me sensei of mm-hmm. what I need to look for next. I remember last time it was look for good school districts, look for a place that I want to be, yeah. study the market. What, what do I need to do from here? What's kind of the next phase to real estate? Well, that's a good question. So, and that's, no, that's a really good point. I think dentistry is one of those it's definitely not a means to an end, but it gives us the availability to have maybe some finances on the side to grow. Um, where to head next? I think the best thing at this point, cause we kind of talked on why, you know, figure out your why, figure out where, you know, and kind of use some of those metrics to figure out those things. I think the next best part, or at least from my point of view is uh, diversification. And so what I mean by that is, um, and maybe Robert Kiyosaki would disagree with me with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He has a lot more focused point of view and definitely way more qualified than I am. But um, I had a few questions with people that reached out to me when they heard this podcast. They're like, okay, you know, talk about your risk portfolio, talk about your fail safe, talk about your rent pro- prices. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think diversification kind of hits all of those, you know, so whether that's your risk portfolio, you know, are they in different demographics like we talked about? Are they, you know, I like to mix them up. So I, mine are in different areas. And so, um, I have, I'm trying to do the math now. I've got three duplexes and a triplex in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And, um, each one of them is in a different area. One's in a college, you know, college demographic, one's in a lower demographic, one's kind of in an upper demographic. And so my hope is, and you know, I'm, I'm young here. I don't -hmm. don't know what the market's going to do. Um, Alistair McDonald gave me a lot of really good advice last year, which has panned out really well and been very helpful. But um, bottom line, listening to other people, but I've kind of put them in different areas so that if the market does anything, hopefully it doesn't monopolize all the different venues, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you're diversified. So, so, I mean, 
Yeah. Basically, what I'm understanding exactly. to, is if if one goes down, hopefully not all the eggs are in one basket, and you'll actually be okay and be exactly. safe because you you put them in different areas. Mm-hmm. Is that is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. Basically, a subset within a subset. So, you know, a lot of eggs are in real estate, but not all are not all are in the same style of real estate, if that makes sense. Okay. So. Okay. So talk about your risk portfolio. To those who don't understand, aka myself, what exactly does that mean? Um, walk us through kind of like what mm-hmm. your risk portfolio is and how you determine what you're going to buy or not buy. It's a good question. Um, mine right now is very, very small. My risk, oh, how do I say this? My risk meter is very low meaning i don't you know if you look at the if you look at dividends in the stock market a three percent return is pretty good um with dental school you know i've I've got you know i'm using it to help pay for school but also you know my wife is in school we take out some loans for that in order for me not to pay down my loans faster um you know those loans grow at eight percent so i use my personal finances obviously for real estate but you know, my, mar- my margin and my meter now is no longer a 3% growth compared to the market, or even if you say a healthy 7 to 10% growth. Mm-hmm. Um, my risk has to be lower and my margin of growth has to be much higher, which makes finding real estate a lot more difficult. Mm-hmm. But um, for the sake of just generic terms, if you can find something, it's called cap rate, the amount you invest in a place, if it can yield a return higher than 10, 12%, usually that's pretty healthy. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> now, now there's there's a lot of things that can go into there. So risk portfolio is a pretty broad term. I would say when I use it, I talk about you know maybe buying a newer place, and so looking at the high ticket items. The roof, you know, is 25 years. It's kind of its life term. Um, the HVAC system, you know, your furnace and your um, air conditioning. Those mm-hmm. are some pretty big ticket items. The plumbing, you know, kind of looking at different um, things that are going to go out and expire. It's you want to either pick a home that has newer things and, you know, a newer roof that's only, you know, it's five years old. You've got 20, 25 years left on that roof. That's a much lower risk for high expense items coming due. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of like, it feels like to me, if I'm going to connect it to dental terms of, when I tell yeah. patients or dentists that are looking to buy a practice, I say, okay, here are the things that I have as my quick checklist to ensure that they're they're checking that off. And it sounds like you have a similar thing for when you're going to buy real estate of mm-hmm. what is the roof? What is the HVAC? I mean, look at the foundation. Of, Absolutely. I'm sure it sounds like it's a pretty similar type checklist mm-hmm. to compare those two. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, I mean, that's a phenomenal point. It's a checklist and it's a system so that you don't miss things. I'm not detail oriented by nature. And so through big mistakes in the past and missing things, it's like, okay, now I've got a list of, you know, it's, it's legitimately a list in the notes on my phone. I'm like, okay, what is the first thing I look at? And I go down there and I make little notes of how old is this? How old is this? How old is this? And I'll use that when purchasing a house. Cause sometimes, you know, you can actually get construction loans or loans, when you purchase a house, the bank will give you a little extra money to do immediate fixes. So, Mm -hmm. um, it just, it goes into that negotiation. I'm sure it's the same with, you know, buying a dental practice. If things aren't where they should be, it's just a good tool to use of, okay, maybe it's not worth X. I'm going to buy it for this amount less because I've got to put A, B, and C into it. 100%. That's exactly what it is. Okay. So friend, if you were helping Mm -hmm. me out and I was going to go look for one, what would kind of be my quick checklist? Roof, HVAC, uh, because like in a dental office, I tell people when you're going to go buy a dental practice, these are the things I always check for. Look at their instruments. How many instruments do they have? What's their supplies? Are they totally like Mm -hmm. bombed out? What's their unscheduled treatment plan? How much is sitting in AR? Because you want to make sure you help with, Uh check to see are you going to buy their AR or not? Also look how old that AR Mm -hmm. is to see what the AR is from. Um, Look to see the equipment. Is the equipment hygiene? old? Hygiene, hygiene percentage? Totally. Check in hygiene because that's a great opportunity. Looking to see, are they maxed mm-hmm. on all procedures? I'm looking for how can you advance that practice and also what are they already doing? Yep. Plus what's going to be like if you're going to buy the mm-hmm. building or if you're going to buy the practice, look to see mm-hmm. AR, 
all those pieces. So like, that's a quick checklist that I have people run through. I mean, looking at notes, looking at perio, looking at uh, diagnosing, looking to see how far out the schedule is booked. So, Hey guys, if you're wanting to buy a practice, I just like literally vomited my checklist for what I look for (laughs) when buying a practice. So Fred, what would be your quick vomit list? If I'm going to go look at a house or duplex that you quickly run through without going fully into detail, because I know that's taken years and a lot of mistakes that you've made. (laughs) Oh yeah. Well, no, I love that because I'm going to go back and listen to this and write those down. I can put it on half speed. <laughs> I figured like, <laughs> I hey, if I list. if I give this piece, will friend give me pieces on my side? Like, I'll just oh, rattle this off. I've never you know, you always get it. <laughs> so, oh and I wanted no. to help out um, as a quick, like, quick checklist. So what would be your quick checklist oh, off it. the top of your head for when okay. you go buy a duplex or another piece of real estate? Because I feel like I'm more like you yeah. than those seasoned investors who are like, just Absolutely. buying all sorts of crazy stuff that I don't even think about buying. So what is your quick checklist? Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, I got to say it's definitely a learning process and I don't claim to be, like I've told you before, I'm not an expert. I'm just in the trenches and I can tell you what I've learned. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The first thing I do when I walk to a property is just get a general health um, evaluation. You know, is a place taken well care of and you can see that easily by landscaping on the exterior paint windows, um, big ticket, so just walk in and see the general health, you know, like a dental practice, what's the morale like, what are, you know, what's going on inside, how do things look? Um, you can tell a lot by what, how someone cares for something is generally going to be seen not only on the cosmetics, but it's going to go way more than cosmetic deep. Mm-hmm. Um, big ticket items, though. windows are a big thing, especially if you live in a colder area. Um, so Kentucky is not terrible, but mm-hmm. Utah, Nevada, um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure. What is your guys's? winter's like does it get really cold there so in reno it it definitely snows we get a decent amount of snow it it melts pretty quickly but Mm -hmm. we do drop in temperature up here and we're not far from tahoe so we have more extreme if you're sitting in vegas you're in like the extreme of heat so pending upon but up here in reno definitely have the Mm -hmm. snow and all four seasons that come through i gotcha okay well windows can really leak heat a lot and so as a owner you know, with having the tenant's best interest in mind, I like to put nice windows in one because it looks nice. But two, if they know anything about it, they'll know that saves them a lot of money. So mm-hmm. windows are a big ticket item. Okay. You're easily looking at two hundred dollars a, a per window, and then another two hundred for install. So if you just do a quick yeah. math of four hundred dollars per window, um, <clears throat> you can see how quickly that adds up. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next thing would be furnaces. Um, I would say a a standard year on those would be about 15 years, but I've seen some only last eight and I've seen other ones last 20, you know, it just depends on how you take care of them and the luck of the draw. Got it. Um, a furnace can be thousands and thousands to replace, uh, with install, depending on how, you know, my rule of thumb is if HVAC, H, the HVAC system. So Mm -hmm. the condensing unit outside the air conditioning unit Mm -hmm. interior, I just immediately ticket about 6,000 for that. Okay. Um, furnace is similar. Um, another thing is if you look and you see that the plumbing, I don't remember when the code changed. I'm terrible with those. Uh, early 1970s is when wiring changed. And so we went from a two wire to a three wire system, meaning we have a ground fault. Mm -hmm. We have a ground wire within the wiring and electrical. I'm not an electrician, but, um, that's really key. And a lot of people see the safety in that. And they like to have a house with, you know, just it's, you know, houses weren't burning down before that. But it's, you know, it's just an added safety feature. So um, it's another big ticket item if a house is outdated with wiring and not to code. And Mm -hmm. then, um, so that's wiring. Plumbing would be, if it's copper, it's great. If it's galvanized, we have since learned that what we put in our water causes the galvanized piping to rapidly degrade. So if it's silver looking, Mm -hmm. you know, the hot and cold is silver looking and not your copper or PEX is like a plastic. Mm -hmm. um, that's, That's outdating plumbing and you know, here in Kentucky, it's almost completely occluded. The pipes might be an inch wide, but only an eighth inch or, you know, maybe a quarter inch is all that's left inside those pipes where water's flowing through. Gotcha. Okay. um, Good to know. Those are all big. Yeah. Those are basically my biggest ones. So if all those are, you know, you usually find a mix and match. So that and the roof. Okay. And I love that you gave... through and those going to help. Well, and I love that you just gave a... No, don't be sorry at all. Uh, (laughs) 
I I love that you gave a price point of how much those on average, and of course it's going to vary across the country of how much your area. I mean, if we're talking San Diego, it's clearly going to be more. If we're talking maybe Montana, yep. maybe less. But I love that you gave a ballpark of all those different areas because I would have no clue. And I know I go in with like these green eyes of excitement mm-hmm. and then it's like, oh, yeah. shoot, like, that costs a lot more than I ever would have guessed. Uh, just like Dennis, yeah. like, I wanted to play. I'm so sad I never convinced Midwestern to do this when I was there. So friend, maybe you do it in Kentucky and let me know how it shakes out. Mm. But I wanted to play the yeah. game of like the price is right on dental, dental supplies because Dennis, dental yeah. students don't understand how much a small little carp of composite uh-huh. costs or even anesthetic. And so playing that similarly with this now of the prices are, I would have no clue what a roof would cost without ever having done it. And mm-hmm. you've clearly done this. So you could quickly ballpark all those items, just like I know more of how much your supplies are going to cost and where to get those discounted yeah. or whatnot. So that was really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that quick checklist. I appreciate that a lot. No, absolutely. Okay. Uh, quick question for you, yes. Kara. So when you talk about supplies, um, cost per procedure, do you guys do that in offices? Do you find it helpful to like break down exactly how much a procedure is going to cost you based on supplies? Mm. Do you guys do that? I've heard of that being done in the past. Right. Is it important? That's like Mark Costs is his his thing so for those of you who don't know what friend and i are talking about what mark does is he goes in and he literally figures out the cost of every single gauze cotton roll floss composite carpule anything so he knows and he had his team do this and they went through every single thing and then they they broke it all down and his thought is you know think about mcdonald's think about these huge corporations they know the cost of a sesame Mm -hmm. seed they know the cost of what this is so you can run so what i will tell you friend Mm -hmm. is i think if you're a sophisticated office you should know this if you are an office that's just Mm -hmm. purchasing it this is freaking insanity (laughs) for your team to do um something down the road yes i think it i think it can be valuable um i never did it in a practice and it's not something i recommend if their supplies are pretty Mm -hmm. basic the reason being is because i feel like it's a very easily outdated list and so i feel like it's a lot of effort yeah then supplies are going to change in your list is very quickly outdated Mm -hmm. so i granted though i'm not a huge high detail person mark's more detail oriented than i am i'm more if you're in the parameters of what's allowed of your five percent supplies getting your labs at nine percent or together at 14 percent if you're sitting pretty there cool i'm not worried about it if you're always Mm -hmm. struggling let's figure out what your cost is. You might be getting a really high expensive supply. So that's my down and dirty answer from a, an actual team. Do I think it's beautiful when Mark does it? And when my, I, like I have recommended it to, we're talking an office that's, you know, they're looking for how do I go from 97% case acceptance to 98% case acceptance. That type of sophisticated mm-hmm. office. Yeah, you better believe I'll have them do a cost yeah. per procedure because they're at that level of sophistication. Mm-hmm. So there's my there's just better low hanging fruit to maybe grab first. Correct. I don't think that this is a huge low hanging fruit opportunity, like you said. And so therefore I'm going mm-hmm. to go after bigger opportunities that will get the team more involved. Yeah, Once you. you are super sophisticated mm-hmm. and you're on it, go for it. It's a genie it's a it's a dreamy yeah. McDreamy thing to do for sure. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, two two other questions some people asked me after listening to your podcast was fail safes to protect yourself and then how to figure out rent prices in local areas. You mind okay. if we talk about those? Of course, I want you to. And I love that people reach out to you, friend, because you are a wealth of knowledge. And guys, if you can't tell already, friend is mm. just a jack of all trades. He seriously is. I mean, when I saw you at VOD, you were up like making breakfast for all the guys in the Airbnb and then you win uh, <laughs> like rock, paper, scissor. I and you also keys. know real estate. So if you guys haven't realized, mm. friend, you are a wealth of knowledge. So I love that people actually reached out to you. So yes, let's go to fail safe and let's also well, talk about rent prices. Awesome. Well, first, let me say this, Kira, though. One of the biggest things I've learned from being a jack of all trades master at none, though, is that it's so much. I love it. I'm now trying to more streamline into dentistry and let other people do what they're really good at. So I'm so mm-hmm. excited to get out and hire a coach straight out of school. You know, yeah, I've studied and I've, you know, poured into what Mark Costas has done. I listen to your podcast all the time. And more than anything, it's shown me, okay, these people are way better at this than I'll ever be. I'm going to let them do what they do great and let me be a dentist. So sure. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for I've that. I've dabbled in a lot of things, but I'm never going to try and 
be a jack of all trades and still try and <laughs> somehow attempt to master more I, than one. I think it's I think so. it's that zone though of the law of diminishing returns, right? Right now you're in school. So it's super important for you to be a yeah, jack of all no. trades. You don't have the financial resources sure. for it. Eventually it will become mm-hmm. a law of diminishing returns to know how to do everything because your time is more valuable prepping teeth than learning how to create a treatment tracker that I could easily send you. So that's therefore that's very fair. Where, where you've got to watch that. So I think it's mm-hmm. great. Keep it up. Okay. Let's talk real estate. That's great. All right. So fail safes. Um, <laughs> it, I, I think the best thing to say is it's going to be different from every, for everyone, right? Depending on your risk, not portfolio, but how risky you like to be. I don't know. The Your term risk for tolerance. It, but, is that you know, what it is? W- the risk tolerance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Welcome. Yeah. So like my wife's very risk adverse. My parents are very risk adverse. They've been debt free since, um, before I was born, you know, just, you know, some people really don't like risk. I would say I'm more risk tolerant than a lot of people I know. And so it just kind of lands where, you know, all to say your fail states are going to be different. Sure. Your fail states are going to be different than mine, different than everyone's. But I think a very important one, and Dave Ramsey really, you know, harps on this is a rainy day fund. So mm-hmm. to have, um, it's really easy if you have one house to kind of calculate that, right? So if you have a roof that's 25 years old <clears throat> and you put it brand new on this year, I would set a simple math equation so that you're putting a little bit into a jar you know, for the cost of that roof that, so that it's completely full at the next 25 years. Kind of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, my rough is 3% of a home's value is what I kind of use. Okay. Um, but as you get more houses, what do you mean you by know, that? Hang on. You're not 3% keep, of the house value. Yeah. Like that's what you try to keep in a fund at all times for that house. Or what do you mean by 3% yeah, as a minimum? Okay. As a minimum. So, okay. <clears throat> so let's say a house is worth a hundred thousand dollars. You have 3000 just sitting there for repairs. Gotcha. At all times. That that, yes, it does. Yeah. Just like what Ryan Isaac. This is a minimum. Yeah. Like Ryan Isaac with the Dennis Money Advisors. I was talking to him about how do you set up practices? And he says, you need to have three months of operating expenses in your account to have a successful practice. Mm-hmm. And similarly for, for there you, go. you know, bu- business owners or I think people in general have six months worth of personal expenses of what your actual expenses are per month set Absolutely. aside for your, your rainy day fund. So I got you. This is now like our yep. rainy day fund for a house. You do it on 3% of the house's value. Yeah. Now that's just the start of it, right? Because mm-hmm. I would also add on to that maybe six months of the mortgage payment. Smart. And yep. so you see, it'll, it'll climb really quickly. Now that's a healthy house. If you think the you know, we talked about those big ticket items. If you think the furnace is going to go at any moment, I would probably put more in that just to have a better buffer, right? Mm-hmm. So Do you, friend, 3% is like my minimum. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm like totally jumping real quick because no. I think of how I set this up for my own personal life. I personally love, you guys, I just coached two offices on this. I personally love Mm Alley.com. They tend to have the highest yield and for a savings account right now, HSBC or Capital One 360. So my question to you is, do you have bank accounts set up like that with a higher yield savings return for each house that the money's there? And so it'd be like a house on (laughs) Kipper and Young or whatever it is. And I'm going to then put the 3% into that high yield. And so you have all these buckets per house or do you have like one one bulk bucket for all your home repairs where you have multiple locations? Yeah, it's an amazing question and I I think it's phenomenal. I have one, I have one account for business emergency fund, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So all my houses I have in one account. Okay. Now, but what I think you touched on, which was incredible, was the high yield savings. I have, I have a phenomenal financial mentor, and he has been very, you know, he started me early on that, and I can't harp on it enough. And I don't think people use it. You know, it's a federally insured totally. account, so it's like a bank account. And mine grows at, it's variable. Now, get it's variable, but the Correct. least it's ever been is one point eight percent, all the way use? up to two point three, I think. I use Citibank and Citibank. now that's going to be very specific to Kentucky because they have no branches in Kentucky yet. So they have a very high mm-hmm. yield mm-hmm. savings account yep. trying to get Kentuckians in. Gotcha. Um, I know that uh, Fidelity has a really good one. I think that's at 1.8. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, not Fidelity, Vanguard. Vanguard does. But, Vanguard does. Uh, yeah. Ally? No, I think that's huge because. Yeah. Ally sits it. It was hovering around 23 
HSBC was at 2.6 yeah. for a while. Then they drop. I think Ally wow. right now is at 1.6 and HSBC sitting around 1.8 or 1.9. And Capital One was at like 0.9, which is why we switched. I did not know about yeah. like Citibank or Vanguard. So guys, like do your research on this because this yeah. stuff is so cool and I just have it on auto draft mm-hmm. or for my business accounts, for you business owners listening, I literally have my operating mm-hmm. expenses, my, excuse mm-hmm. me, not operating, but emergency funds, my tax funds, mm-hmm. all of those sitting in these high yield. Oh, it's huge. Because you, it, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but you actually make a decent chunk of change off of these just by having the money sit uh-huh. in a bank, which they'll be doing anyway, regardless. Absolutely. Um, and what I even do, <laughs> it you know it's pennies but they add up like you're saying i use a credit card when i pay and now i always pay it off in full mm-hmm, but same. i will let that bill go to fruition the full you know it's over 30 days that it allows it to go yep. and then it auto drafts from my account so you get to you're almost you're borrowing from the credit card bank to make an interest on that money before you pull it out of your totally. high yield savings account yep. so you almost make it twice which is so cool guys so. this is like <laughs> like geeking out stuff that i am obsessed with because i think this yeah, is how so many people it. can make their money go further with like simple <laughs> hacks that we just don't do and i think that that's the high discipline okay so that's how you keep it more mm-hmm. like that's how you manage your risk is you have three percent of the home's value plus looking at what high ticket items and then you're just do you just auto draft an amount out x amount every single month to put it in the savings account or how do you manage that so i built it to start with you know and so i have it there's a solid amount just sitting there that does not move Mm -hmm. and so you know sometimes things will come up and i'll draft a little bit out of that um but i always make sure i replenish it but before i do anything else so that's you know that three percent plus six months that can get a little gray once you start to get more um houses because you know not the chances of all just going vacant at once is ridiculous, right? Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes, depending on the banks you use, you can roll mortgages into one. So you can have three houses under one mortgage, if that makes sense. So, oh, very cool. I did it, not know um, that. It saves you a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So PNC does not do it that way. They actually, you have to have a separate LLC and separate mortgage for every single home. Mm-hmm. Um, Fort Bank will allow you to do that. And I think Bank of America maybe will as well. You'll have to. Okay, record, cool. Or fact Super check helpful. On that one. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So all to say it, it gets hazy and it doesn't have to be, it's not an exact mathematical equation when you start to add more in, but it's sure. definitely there. At um, least you've given us a another starting big one point. In there. For sure. And I think, I mean, it ties directly into dentistry, right? Is an insurance, having insurance is huge. So you can plan for all the normal, simple plan stuff, but anything serious happens, there should be an insurance that takes care of that, you know, serious injury to self, uh, fire, all those, I think good insurance, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. So totally um, agree. And that goes right back to dentistry, right? Mm-hmm, so disability, mm-hmm. malpractice, you name it. Right. Exactly. So, okay. Um, what was the other question I yeah. forgot as we like wrap this podcast up? Cause I want to make sure we tie into what the, what people were yeah, emailing. Yeah. Um, it's the cost of rent, right? Podcast? Go ahead. Oh, cost of rent. Yes. Cost of rent would be, I mean, someone asked me like, how do you accurately do that? Well, to be honest with my limited experience, I've always renovated the properties I buy or mm-hmm. made them nicer. And so I walk around before I ever buy a property and literally knock on all the doors in that area and find out what everyone's paying for rent. And then I just charge <laughs> a little bit more. So, <laughs> so pre- you know, and please, pretend really I'm, cool- please pretend I'm the person that you knock on the door. Like, what do you say to me? Like, Hey, how much do you charge for rent? <laughs> like, seriously, how does that conversation? Well, first thing is I get my wife there. I get Smart. my wife there because she's way less intimidating than bearded me. And, um, and she doesn't weigh, you know, 220. So uh-huh, that uh-huh. helps. But okay. she gets so embarrassed. She's like, why am I here? I'm like, trust me, you're way less intimidating. No, I'll <laughs> knock. I'll be like, hey, look, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you today. Uh, my name's Friend Bechtel. I think the name Friend is less intimidating. Than, it is. Um, That's helpful. Everyone just change your stage name to be like Friend. With name. <laughs> just, just have yeah, a stage exactly. name. <laughs> friend or Amigo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but I'll get up there and I'll say like, hey, I, I apologize. These are semi-personal questions, but you know, I'm looking at purchasing a house in the area and I was just wondering what kind of the going rate around here is. Do you mind me asking how much you pay for rent? And some people are like, you know, they'll look at me weird and I'll be like, well, do you mind if I get your landlord's contact? And most people are like, ah, it's 750. Got it. And okay. I've lived here for five years or I've lived here for, you know, a year. And so it gives you a good, good judge. On gotcha. 
Okay. That. But Kira, before this ends up, we had you on the podcast mm-hmm. in or in Voices in Dentistry. Yes. And we started to get to word verbiage. Yeah, word we did. Ninja. The I word, the word ninja. <laughs> I did. Yeah. And I mean, this is near and dear to my heart because I'm terrible with it. I think I used to enjoy watching people squirm when I'd ask things the wrong way. <laughs> and it's become like almost second nature to where I, I definitely don't ask things. One, the most politically correct, but two, it's like, I just, there's so many better ways. Can you kind of unpack what you mean by word ninja? Because that's yeah. something that you brought on the podcast. And I think we're going to do an entire episode about it. Here sure. soon. This is why I love podcasting with friend guys, because we can literally go back and forth. Like I'll ask my questions on real estate. He asks his questions on, on word ninja-ing. And I know you genuinely are interested. So what I mean by word ninja is how can I, and people might package this as manipulative. I don't care what you choose to call it. I say, make sure you've got good ethics behind you. Um, And my, my mindset Mm -hmm. with word ninja is how can I get my point across of what I want while making you feel like a million bucks in the process? So it's genuinely that win, win. Um, I'm just making sure I package my words in a way that comes to you in the way I mean it. For example, I mean, you can tell Riley, your wife, that she looks not so great in an outfit in a really good way where she'll take it totally awesome. Or you can literally say it to her in an awful way and she'll be like, what the friend? Um, And I say it's the same thing. You literally could say the same thing like you don't look great or, you know, I think maybe your black dress might look better than the red one tonight. You literally just said the same thing, but you word ninja'd one of them to where she feels like a million bucks and you got your point across versus the one where you're just blunt mm-hmm. and direct. I don't think you shouldn't be blunt. It's just like, instead of saying, unfortunately to a patient, say the good news is and find good news for them. Or instead of saying, do you want to pay for this or do you want to get scheduled? Say, hey, let's get you scheduled for that. I could help you with this. Or your policy is, we don't take cancellations via text message. Well, today a girl was role playing with me and she's like, so we don't take cancellations via text message. And I was like, okay, cool. Or could we say like, Hey, thanks for letting me know. Just so you know, I can't take any appointment changes via text, but give me a quick call and I'll be happy to help you out. It's that packaging it with sprinkles that helps them feel like a million bucks Mm -hmm. while still getting your point across is how it's like, how do you add a little bit of sugar to that? How do you add a little bit of honey to that without, without manipulative, Mm -hmm. It's just packaging so many things. Doctors, you can easily tell a patient they need a crown and make them feel terrible because they didn't come in. Or you can compliment them and say, like, you know, I'm super proud of you for being here. We're going to get you taken care of. I'm going to help you out with that. Let's get started on that crown. Let's get you back to a healthy mouth. Like both ways get the same point. It's just, are you a word ninja creating the world you want to live in? Or are you saying your words and they're coming across completely different than what you're attending. Does that make sense? Is that is that clear? What, what yeah, no, I'm over here furiously writing down, <laughs> trying to <laughs> keep as many of these straight. Where did when did it when did you start to notice it? Was it watching other dentists make, make this mistake? Was it when you were assisting? When did you start to realize how crucial it was ordering and using different words to? Uh, who I can't remember who said it. Was that Voices of Dentistry? And again, I'm going to say and use the worst words possible, but it's not manipulation. Like everything we do is influencing a dental patient, right? And so Mm -hmm. you have to ethically do it, but no matter what you say, you're going to influence them one way or the other. So use your increased knowledge and keep their best interests in mind, but help show them what is most important and valuable for them. So when did you start to see, how did you start to see this was so crucial and that people did it wrong? Um, So I started to see this as that... uh, I, I started watching in my own life when I was, when I was trying a treatment plan and I would present a treatment plan and I would either get the results yeah. that I was looking for, or I would be like, people yeah. wouldn't be saying yes to me. And then I started noticing, um, when I worked at the dental college, I remember there was a girl I worked with and I didn't get s- along with her super great. And I started noticing the way I said yep. words would would result in a different response. And so I started playing with it, honestly. We sat in a cage. I called it my my roaming tiger cage at Midwestern. <laughs> like we were literally in a cage yeah. to hand out these teeth and these instruments. It was such a small little room that we we like, I wanted to dress up as a tiger one year for Halloween because I felt like I was a roaming tiger in there and I couldn't go anywhere. And I can't imagine you in a small room. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and two people in the there, world. it was nuts. And so what I wanted, I what I started realizing is I could say things differently to her <laughs> and I would get different results. So I really started like beta testing on her of 
you know what? I want her yeah. to do this. Well, let me try different ways to say it and see what she would get. And then after that, I left Midwestern. Um, I actually had a good friend. She was the one who coined the word, the, the phrase word ninja. And she said, Kira, how can you write mm-hmm. this email to get the results you're looking for and make them love you at the end of it? And I was like, great question. So I, I really do think, and I think a mm-hmm. word ninja is such a good visual. So then I started watching offices yeah. and seeing they could have a different treatment plan or the doctor could get the team members to do what they wanted just based on words. And then I started picking up like very, very, very talented high end doctors. What do they do? And I realized they are word ninjas. They're direct. They're to the point. However, their words are beyond word ninja status. And they just, they say it in a way that people follow them, that love them. Patients follow them and love them. And I started realizing you just change one word here or one word there Instead of saying, do you want, say, let's get you scheduled. That small, simple change will change a yes or a no. So I always say there are no failures. There are just results. Thank you, Tony Robbins. Like there are no failures, just results. What result are you getting? And is it the result you actually want? If not, look at the words you're using because odds are those words are what are creating the world you're living in. Hmm. That's really powerful. There are no failures, just results. Should see my notepad. <laughs> <laughs> Just text over a picture. We'll we'll have that as your 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 picture for your podcast on this one. These are the scribbles. I was doing go. the same <laughs> thing with like, okay, this much is this, this much is this. Got it. Here's the quick checklist. Yep, drawn. So- <laughs> yep, arrows here, circles, yes. underlines, highlights, exclamation points. So, uh, where where can we go to get more information on this kind of stuff? Like, do you have? Can we call you? Do you got an email? Where can I t- send people when we start? You know, I've, I've used that term ever since voices several times now <laughs> at UKCD, University of Kentucky. Like, okay, we're ninja. We're ninja. You know, that's yes. directly correlated to your ability to get people to accept these treatment plans that you're trying to do for them. Of course, yeah. We actually made a really cool form that you might want to share with them. So they can email over hello at the dental a And um, it's a okay. it's a phrase or it's a, a sheet that we made up for a treatment planning event called words to use or not use. And we literally go down mm-hmm. the list of words that, a lot of people use and then words to change. And I also would point out if you want more of this, like I I truly mean this when I say this, if you're a treatment coordinator or you're a doctor, just record your exam. I mean, keep it HIPAA compliant. I'm not going to share this with the world. Don't worry. I will not broadcast it. Um, Mm -hmm. Stay HIPAA compliant. If you can send me over, like just do a recording of some phone calls. It's crazy how often we think we're saying it one way and the way it's actually coming out is a completely different way. And that's why I say, that's how you master being a word ninja. Look to see are the results you're getting the ones you want. If not, how could you word ninja that up? So send it over. If people have questions or like, Hey, Kira, I can't get this treatment plan to close. How would you say it? Um, Or what are some things you've heard other Mm -hmm. offices do? By all means, email over. I'm happy to share that form. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to listen to phone calls. Um, I'd be more than happy. We Mm -hmm. coach offices on this all the time. I would say the bulk of my coaching is on how to change your phrases to get the results you want. Awesome. So that's hello at the dental team, right? Mm-hmm. Hello com. at the dental team.com. Yeah. And friend, if people want to reach out to you, how do they contact you? Uh, best way is life and dentistry at gmail.com. Cause you know that and they then, have that cool I podcast mean, guys. Go check it out. They have an awesome, awesome podcast. That's one of the easiest ways, but I'm I'm always happy to answer a text or call as well. My cell is 502-715-1322. I can't wait for this to be yeah, the evergreen I, for you, friend, because, you know, in like six years when you're the super busy, popular dentist and people are still texting you about real estate yeah. questions, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <clears throat> no, I love it. Chris Bowman actually shared his... And actually, Aaron Nicholas as well. They both shared their cells. And they were two of the first I ever reached out to. And it's because they had their cell. And it Mm -hmm. it greatly impacted me. So I'm like, you know what? I'm always happy. If someone has a question, I may not have the answer, but I can definitely point you to someone who does. I agree. Well, friend, as always, I love these podcasts. And I love your generosity. And I love learning from you. I love that you pick my brain. It's a really fun, um, Mm -hmm. vivacious podcast every single time. So thank you. Thank you for what you're contributing to the world of dental. I'm so excited for the future of dentists coming out because I know so many of them are just Mm -hmm. like you. So thank you for contributing and, and just being who you are in our in our dental space we get a share.
Well, thank you so much, Kara. And oh. thank you again for always being willing to answer a text or call. Of course. I do it way too much. <laughs> Anytime. I'm the same way. My phone number is plastered everywhere because I feel like if we can change one person or help them out, let's do it. So, friend, as always, Absolutely. thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. All right, you have a good one, Kara. All right, you too. All right, guys, this is Friend. Thank you again, and thank you, Dental Team listeners, and I'll catch you next time on the Dental Team Podcast. And that wraps it up for another episode of the Dental Team Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Oh,